Hi, my name is Jim Moyle, and here to talk some more about WPF and PowerShell. And this is the second part of our two-part look at run spaces. So in the first part, um, we had a look at how run spaces can improve uh, the usability of your and the performance and the smoothness of your application. And we're just going to have a look, a little review of that, seeing as it is a two-parter now. If you remember, uh, what we did was create a, a small application with the ability to do a sleep to uh, simulate a long-running task in the background. And without run spaces and all the logic in the main thread, if we hit start sleep now, then that ties up the UI. We can't do anything about it until that uh, sleep finishes and then it returns control of the UI back to us. And we did an excellent job of achieving this by adding in run spaces and putting that sleep off into another thread. And then we told the dispatcher to report back to the main UI thread once uh, that had finished. And let's have a quick look at that. So now if we do a, a five second sleep, we can still move all of our um, applications and as soon as it's finished it reports back to the main UI that, uh, that that sleep has finished. So much more responsive, um, much better for the user to, to put that business logic off into a different thread. So let's get into this a little bit more around um, the consequences of this. Now <clears throat> As always, uh, all the code will be on GitHub for you to download and have a look at. So feel free to go and steal my code and use it wherever you like, essentially. Now, what we're going to try and do here is instead of having the UI in the main thread and all of the business logic in a second thread, we're going to try and get a bit more clever here. And we're actually going to try and put the UI in its own thread as well. And this means that we've definitely got separation between the UI and the main thread. So that completely isolates it from anything happening in the main thread, which may cause speed, performance, or responsiveness issues. Now, we've got our get XAML object function, which we know of old, which will help us to launch our um, GUI. We've got this synchronized hash table, which we talked about last episode, which effectively is giving us a hash table which we can share across multiple run spaces. And we can update it from and read multiple run spaces. And we can read from multiple run, run spaces what you've updated as well. So it's a good way to communicate information between run spaces. We're getting the path and um, uh, then we're putting that into the, our synchronized hash table as well. That will become important later. <clears throat> now, when we start this run space that we wanted to put the uh, GUI thread in, then we're not going to have this get XAML object function. That will only be in the main thread. Now, run spaces have got some nice functions to get all kinds of things into the thread when you're starting them. One is the synchronized hash table, or even just any variable, as we've seen previously. And another is the ability to add functions uh, into, the, um, into the run space thread as it's starting. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get content, and we're going to go to the function drive, and we're going to get the XAML object. So we've now we've effectively got uh, an array of strings which contain the, the function get XAML object. What we're going to do now then is create a new object which is um, a session state function entry and call it get XAML object and to give it the variable that contains all of the, um, uh, the, the array of strings that we just previously read from the function drive. Then we're going to create an initial session state object and we're going to add that get XAML object into the initial session state. Now, this initial session state is what we're going to use when we create the uh, run space. 
and now we can see that um, we're going to add the initial session state to uh, to the run space and we're going to do a couple other things as well so we know how to add the synchronized hash table and we know how to add the um, add the functions now I think you should always put your even though we could just run the function inside and create the function inside this run space and not bother having to insert it at this point I always like to have my uh, all of my functions in the uh, root in the thread root that means that I can then insert them into whatever child threads that I wish to because if I start putting them down in the tree and I need to then add it into another branch of that tree I don't want to be re writing that function out twice and having um, code that's uh, that's replicated between threads I want to define the function once and use it in any thread so you need to define it up top and then add it in as it goes not only can you get functions and variables in you can also add in modules um, and you can add in snap-ins at the um, run space thread start there's a couple of new options that we've got in here as well one is run space thread options reuse thread which uh, is a config to help stop uh, memory leaks and we've also got uh, the apartment state which is single threaded apartment state um, a WPF GUI needs STA mode for it to work otherwise it will uh, error out when you try and import the uh, XAML um, <clears throat> If we have a look in our normal console, if we look at the console run space, because obviously the console is running in its own root run space as well, we can see by default the apartment state is STA and the thread options is reuse thread. This means that uh, when we're creating our run space, if we sort of mimic our console and also the nowadays the ISE reflects these values as well, we'll get the greatest possibility to uh, have, a, have a good result in our code. All right. So we're going to add in the sync hash and then inside here is going to be our uh, UI code and then we're going to um, start that UI so um, this time I'm going to start it from within our console so now what we have as you can see we have now returned control of our console back to us so we can uh, now run things in the console as well as um, in our main window so let's have a look what we've got here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a whole lot of loops in another thread and then update the screen with a count and then we're going to time how long it takes. So if we do 10 and we run the dispatch here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it's going to count up and it's going to tell us how many milliseconds that took. In this case, 2,500 two and a half seconds so let's have a look at our code how are we getting our GUI inside its individual thread so we're going to do exactly the same as we usually do and pass the correct XAML files to get XAML object function and what we're going to do is we're going to add each of those into our sync hash so now we have all of our um, GUI objects available in our sync hash. And in our dispatcher, we can see we've added an event for the uh, dispatcher button. And so from our UI run space, we're now creating another child run space. So a bit of run space inception for you for uh, another run space now it's got exactly the same configuration as before and what are we doing so we're going from one to whatever's in the um, 
text box and we've checked that here so sync actually interaction iteration so we're reading it from the uh, sync hash because we can read it in this thread before we have to access it in the child thread and we're also resetting the uh, final displays back to nothing so and the previous run disappears so we get a nice UI responsive visual response when we hit the button that something's actually happening so previously did one to ten for each object update the text box text with one two three four five seven eight ten by using the dispatch or invoke action yep and we're going to wrap that in a measure command so we can get our uh, timing for the entire process um, ignore this because I'm using two different methods of updating the same UI I, I've had to do a bit of logic around it to stop uh, any race conditions or any visual oddities so this is not uh, not a line that you'll need unless you're doing exactly the same thing that I am and then we're using the dispatcher again to update with some nice formatted uh, text to whatever the, uh, the the time taken is and then right at the end we're going to uh, start the run space here using the beginning invoke and um, we're also going to save some config but we'll come back to that later all right so <clears throat> um, let's have a look at the other method now so the other method is the timer method and if we go back to our GUI we can show that if we do 10 here and run the timer now this now takes 17 milliseconds that's far far better in terms of performance and we didn't even see the uh, numbers updated so let's do 50 run timer 7 milliseconds so that's extremely quick let's have a look how we've done that So we start off exactly the same way. We grab the number of iterations we want from the uh, text box and reset the uh, finish value so we get a visual cue to the fact that somebody's doing it. The run space options are exactly the same. So here's our code before we start our... Um, oops. There we go. Timer. Exactly as I say, blah, blah, blah. And here's the code that before we start the uh, timer. Now we're just going to set a flag for the timer to tell it to execute uh, the code, but we'll get to that in just a second. But we're using a fairly similar construct here. We use a measure command from 1 to 10 or 50 as we just saw. For each object, update this variable. This is not updating um, the UI thread. This is just updating a single variable in sync hash. So you can imagine that uh, if the dispatcher invoke takes 250 milliseconds approximately to update the UI, just updating this single variable is not going to take that long. And then again, we're getting the final time from measure command and putting it in a, in a variable in sync hash. Again, not updating the thread, just updating a variable and uh, beginning the run space. So all we've done is we're just updating two variables uh, in our sync hash. So what's the magic? The magic is here in the timer. So the update block is the is the code that we're going to run for every tick of this timer. And we create the timer by creating a new object system in Windows Threading Dispatch Timer. That's in the presentation core namespace. <coughs> Time interval is 100 times every second. So and you could think of that as 100 frames a second or maybe not but uh, it depends how long that update block script takes to run but we're going to run it fairly often so it's uh, updating the screen a lot every tick will run the update block and then we'll start the timer and um, there is a nice is enabled um, property on the timer so we can show whether uh, we can do an action if it's uh, if it's correctly enabled what's in the update block so if sync hash watch number so that's the set we said true or false yep or the uh, 
final text isn't the same as, as, as the iterate, number of iterations. Again, this is because um, we're, we've got two methods of updating the same field, so it's just a bit of logic to stop any, any race conditions, etc. And then we're going to set the text uh, to whatever number we're, we're watching. So that's where we've put our uh, numbers. Now, you may have noticed that this means is that we're probably not showing every single number on screen like we definitely were with the dispatch method. The reason for this is because we don't need to. If you're just showing it to the user, the logic, the business logic behind should not depend on the user seeing every one of a thousand iterations of something. Who cares? As long as the logic behind has caught it, you want things to be smooth and responsive for the user. So the fact that this method isn't actually showing every single number on screen, because it's only updating the screen once every um, hundredth of a second, and if you go from one to five in a thousandth of a second, it's just going to show five. But I'm okay with that. But just something to watch out for if you are using this method. And then again, we're going to update the uh, text block with the with the final time taken. So how much of a difference is there really between this these uh, two methods? Let's have a quick look back at our, our application. So if we do 10 again, and we're going to run the dispatcher, it's going to run up to 10. So two and a half seconds as before. Let's do 100,000 and run the timer and we can see nice and nice and quick and looks great it took less than it took the dispatcher to count to 10 to count to 100,000 so it is extremely significant this difference between the two and if we run the timer we can see ah look nice and smooth and responsive application but if let's put that back to 10 and run the dispatcher so let's just do 20 while we're doing this run the dispatcher What's happening here is that the, the, the dispatch is actually making the, the UI thread do the work. And though it does move, it's very, very weird and it's difficult and it's horrible to use. Now, the whole point of doing run spaces is that we stop this unresponsive GUI from happening. And what we've done is we've built a nice... UI run space, we've built some uh, logic run space, but the chucking the UI updates between the two is actually causing the UI to stutter and, and become unresponsive again. So for these both of these reasons, I don't like um, the dispatcher invoke method because it holds, it holds up your UI thread and it's slow, very slow indeed. All right. So that's um, timers versus dispatchers. We also have a little problem, really, because if I go back to my console and I do a uh, get run space, where have all these come from? So this would make sense, sort of, because what's happening here is uh, I've been opening and using all of these run spaces and then the code in them is finished but I haven't closed them, I haven't done anything with them so if you're using a lot of run spaces um, then you're going to have memory problems because you've effectively got a memory leak and it's always good practice to tidy up behind yourself so for the next section what we've got is here we've got Run space stats, we've got 28 available, 2 busy, and 30 total, which is exactly what we saw in um, the previous just get run space. So let's have a look here. Let's close our timer section. Uh, look in our run space cleanup section. Now then, if I run the time at 10 we can see that now we've got three busy the time is just finished now we've got two busy in and we've added to the available and if I change that to 
one and just hit it uh, just spam click on run timer now we've got 55 run spaces so there's two ways to to close these off and it really highlights the difference between uh, PowerShell 5 and PowerShell 3 as regards run spaces. There's a whole load of really good stuff in run spaces that was introduced in 5. If you want to make your scripts and your run spaces compatible with 3, it's perfectly possible, but it's just harder work. So if we look at this, I can use some uh, PowerShell 5 commands, get run space where object run space availability equals available, i.e. the code is finished. For each object, then run the dispose method. All right, well, let's see if that works. Excellent. So what I've done is I've now closed all of those available run spaces. If I run get run space in the console again, I've just got the two busy. Run space one is this console, and run space 30 is this UI. So that's the minimum amount of, uh, of run spaces we've got available to us. So let's say for PowerShell 3, because this is only available in PowerShell 5. For PowerShell 3, we need something to do something different. You remember when I said up in the uh, dispatcher versus time a bit in the uh, dispatcher that we saved the configuration for later use and this is the later use that uh, that we're going to get to so run space cleanup we've got these previous configurations and we're actually going to use them to end the invocation so this is this uh, object that we've saved or well, object that we've created is essentially your key to to unlock administrative actions on that particular run space and now we can run a close and a dispose on that run space because we've got these keys which is the objects which is the configuration now if you want to do this on more than just one you're going to have to save these key objects the that open the run space doors for each run space you create because without it you can't do anything in powershell 3 to uh, close or end these run spaces apart from closing or ending the parent PowerShell process. So how does that work? So basically if I run the dispatcher and let's just check that we've got no uh, available, no available, okay. So if I run the dispatcher once and now I've got one available run space, I can use that to get rid of it. But if I do it three or four times and then close the last one, I will only get the last one because I only saved the key, so I overwrote it, right? I only saved the key to that last run space. So it's really important if you want to support PowerShell 3 that you save the variable for each run space as you create it, otherwise you won't be able to get back. And then I can just use the, the PowerShell 5 method to close them if I want to. So it's really key for uh, for bearing in mind where and how you uh, support everything. Okay. There is a couple of very cool um, modules and scripts. Well, one's a script, one's a module that uh, other people have written to make all of this much easier for you. And uh, this first one is a module by uh, Bowie Prox, who's an MVP. And if you look, if you search for anything about run spaces on the internet, you'll find that Bowie's probably written three quarters of the information out there. And he's created this um, module, which takes all of the same uh, commands and, and uh, works the same way as, as a start job, uh, as normal PowerShell jobs. So if you're familiar with PowerShell jobs, then posh RS job it will be excellent for you and you can use that to do all the stuff it will it will support all the previous versions of PowerShell that's possible it will set your apartment mode correctly it will set your reuse thread stuff correctly it will do everything right for you in very simple syntax that you're familiar with the other one is invoke parallel which is a script rather than a module 
and <clears throat> again in a very simple manner it will uh, enable you to um, use run spaces without having to know all the intricacies and without having to, to bother there's also cool stuff like um, this timeout so you can say a maximum time for any run space and um, so I, I really encourage you to both understand how run spaces work but also look at the great resources that other people have provided to make it very much easy for you well if you liked this video please hit like and if you'd like to see further videos on uh, PowerShell then please hit subscribe thank you very much